Last week I ministered on the subject, when God says, I will. And he does. Amen. Today is part two, because I didn't get done last week. And it's entitled, God is over all. It's kind of hard to wrap our mind around that. The first thing that a sinner says to me when they're in trouble is, if he's a good God, why is he allowing this? Why did he allow such and such? Or, or why am I sick? You know, that because they don't understand the sin issue. There was perfection in our world until sin. And the, the afflictions that we have, the troubles that we have, the difficulties that we have is because of sin. It's not necessarily that you sin or I sin, perhaps we have, but it's because of Adam's sin in the beginning that perfection was lost. And it's hard for us as Christians to deal with the people in the world because they want to blame God for everything, and Christians sometimes blame God. But God is overall, and I just had this thought this week as I looked at for the message as I wanted to continue this message, and I thought, how often does our mind wander in spiritual places? How many this morning, you don't have to answer this, but how many here, while we were in worship, that your mind went somebody someplace besides worship? I'm on the platform. <laughs> Saints, you know, are we totally, you know, keyed in to this moment of worship and this moment of our mind stayed on him? That is so difficult because the enemy of our soul is constantly attacking us. He goes to church too. And he causes trouble in this saints, and he causes warfare in our spirit. So today I just want to ask that question, you know, can we focus? Can we focus on godly things for no reason? You know, when I'm sick, I focus. You know, when when I have financial problems, I focus. You know, when my children are in trouble, I focus. But can we just focus because we love him? Can we just focus because he's been so good to us? When you get to my age, you can look back over many years and you can see the mercy of God and the grace of God. And we need to focus on those things that God has done for us and the things that he has brought us through. It's hard to not wander in this day of so much corruption in our world. I was thinking of thoughts that just erupt in us, like, you know, what is in the heart of God when he sees our failure, our Christianity's failure? What, what is in his heart when he looks across this earth today to the multitudes of churches that are gathered together? What is in his heart? Does he see sincerity? Does he see true worship or just lip worship? What does he see? Do you ever just wonder what he sees? Does he see people worshiping or people doing their duty? What does he see? Do we ever have these thoughts in our mind? Does he, does he see our joy? Do we have joy because we're in the house of the Lord and we're free from the outside world for a moment? Does, does he sing? The Bible says he sings it over us. Do you ever think about that? Do you ever just be going along on your everydayness and all of a sudden you think, God is singing over me. <laughs> Usually we feel the devil's after me. No. But God does sing with me. And God, he thinks about us. I used the scripture this morning, you know, the, 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 the verse of how God breathed into man the breath of life. I mean, you're, we're all sitting here breathing. I hope. <laughs> Even if we're sleeping, we're breathing. You know, and 
do you even have a thought that that breath that is sustaining our life is a gift of God yes. and that it's the presence of God in us and the only time we don't have that breath is when he calls us to be personally with him how interested is God in our daily chores you know we're not interested I don't like taking out the garbage how interested is he in our daily chores where we go what we do our activities how, how interested is he in us to pay attention to those little things that occur in our life when we watch the football game like yesterday yay for the hot guys when we go shopping you know then we say oh i better pay my ties and not buy that dress today you know is he interested in those things or does he just leave that to us to make all those decisions on our own you know? in our moment of dreamy thoughts and moments we all have dreams we have bucket lists i mean you know is he interested in what we desire well, Psalm 139 is a tried and true passage of scripture that I've used, Counseling Chamber uses it. But this week as I read in my devotions and I read Psalm 139, I saw there that God weaves the process from seed to birth. He weaves that all in. He knew us, he knew our hearts, he knew everything about us, he named us, our parts were written, all these things before our birth he had thoughts of us and verse 17 when david wrote this psalm and it realized in his spirit how what he was what god was saying there he said and he said how precious are your thoughts to me O god you know how great is the sum of them uh they're like i can't number them they're like the sands of the sea now, I can't, I can't believe that the Church of Jesus Christ is spiritual enough to think about the thoughts that God thinks of us, that they are as multitude as the sands of the sea. I tell you what, we think many times more of the heartaches that the enemy plants in our path than we do the goodness of God that he has thought towards us. So today, it's God is over all. Is he over this crisis? Yes. Is he over this circumstance? Yes. Is he over this affliction? Yes. God is over all. There's nothing above God. He is the high Lord. Jesus wrote in, um, in Matthew, they pinned his words, and it says, the very hairs of your head are numbered. I mean, isn't that, can you even comprehend that? See, Christianity has lost its comprehension of the holiness and the righteousness and the power of God. We sang that. He is an awesome God. I've said that. I'm sure you've said that. But the minute the enemy comes at us and attacks us with an affliction or a crisis, we forget that the power and the anointing of God is invested in us and the breath we breathe is the power of God. It is sincerely difficult to wrap our fleshly mind around the preciousness and the power and the supernaturalness of God. The very fact that you can take in that breath and let that breath out is a supernatural experience given to us by God. He is awesome, and he's more awesome than the cares of this life. But he wrote in his Bible, in the book, and he said, be careful of the cares of this life because they will overtake you. And I believe today that the cares of this life has overtaken the church of Jesus Christ and the church is trying to do all sorts of things to bring people in rather than to show people the path of salvation. Rather than to show the holiness of God, the righteousness of God, the willingness of God. There's no sin preached 
in Christianity much today. You know, but we need to have that preaching. We need to be, you know, to be inflicted with the power of God's forgiveness that this week, you know, I tripped up and he forgave me. And the and when the Old Testament says when he sees the blood, he will pass over you. That, that's what they said in the Old Testament. And when the blood was on the door place, those people didn't die. Same thing is happening today. When we fail, God looks toward Jesus with the sacrifice of his blood, and his blood passes over us, and he forgives us. That's a miracle of God. The law tries to forgive us. Law can never forgive us the holiness and the freedom that God has. God is over all. God needs to be revered. God needs to be sanctified in the hearts of his people. And he needs to be sanctified in his houses. Because his house is supposed to be a church of prayer. It's not a church, it's not a theatrical, theatrical experience. It's a house of prayer. It's where we meet with God, where we talk to God, where he talks to us, where he convicts us, where he raises us up above our crisis, and he speaks peace to our hearts. Well, God is overall. The glorious moments, you know, the fabulous things that he does for us, he's over that. He's also over the suffering. He's also over the affliction. He's also over the warfare that we feel. If you don't feel warfare today, Satan, you're not bucking up against the devil. If your life is showing the righteousness of God, you're in trouble. Because the enemy is out to harass you with problems and difficulties. He wants your faith to faint. You look at your child that is in a severe situation and you think this is impossible nothing is impossible with god no. the church needs to get back its substance its substance of faith and its substance of belief and its substance of worship and prayer rather than being blessed i like to be blessed it's more fun to be blessed than to be nudged and corrected church trust me it's much more i was corrected this morning because i was sitting here wondering where so and so was and why those benches were so empty and you know here i'm going to preach on this <laughs> but the enemy is out to just block the substance of the glory of god that is revealed in his house this is a safe place this is the place where we meet with god because he's over all. The message today comes from 2 Chronicles. If you have your Bibles, I would like you to turn there because what I'm going to speak to you about is in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. There's an invasion. How many know there's an invasion in our country? And it's an invasion against God. If you haven't noticed that, wake up. There is an invasion that's coming that is going to be, usher in the coming of the Lord. This chapter talks about Israel, and there's a big invasion pending, and the enemy nations are coming against Israel. I don't know if you have had time to read the article in the bulletin today, but it lists the ten top nations, and we're not one of them. So it tells me, that we are losing our power in the midst of the nations. And so Israel is going to have this multiplex of people come against him. And Jehoshaphat, the leader, he rises up. And what touches my heart so much is his prayer. Because in verse 3, here's how he responded to this catastrophic thing that was going to happen to his nation. And church, if you don't believe that things are going to happen to our nation, that is, it is going to be horrendous, it is going to happen. I mean, just look at the hurricanes. That isn't even the, the sinful things that's going on in the nation. That's just the fear of God coming to our nation. But Jehoshaphat responds to the enemy. 
That's what is coming against Israel. That's what's coming against our nation. And that's what's coming against us personally. And he rises up in verse 3, and he says he fears. He fears God. He reverence God. He respects God. He calls upon God. And it says, he says, and he seeks the Lord. And he proclaims a fast throughout all Judea. I believe that if a leader, a Christian leader, rose up and proclaimed a fast throughout Christianity, I'm sure there would be some mumbling. But you know what? That's what is needed today. That leadership needs to rise in Christianity, seek the face of God, and proclaim a fast against the powers of darkness that have set in themselves against our nation and against us personally. And so we proclaim the fast. We sense this warfare. If you sense this warfare, let me know. Do, do you sense it? Do you sense this warfare? It comes in all sorts of ways. Finances, illness, stress, family. It comes in all sorts of ways to stress us and take our mind off of a supernatural God who can answer our prayer. What moved me in this passage of scripture was his prayer. Jehoshaphat rose up to pray. He didn't whine. He didn't try to figure it out himself. He didn't try to do anything about it. He just immediately relied upon God. And this was his prayer in verse 6. He says, O Lord God of our fathers, art now thou the God of heaven? And don't you rule over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thy hand is there not power and might, so that none is able to withstand thee? Sunday school today, we saw that God gave us an avenue to withstand the darts of the enemy, but he gave us the spiritual armor of God. And so Jehoshaphat, he's saying, you know, don't you have the power, don't you have the might, is anything too great to stand against thee? How many times have you faced a crisis and you thought it was just impossible? When you have a feeling of impossibility, then you, you're asking that same question. Isn't God able to withstand this difficulty in my life? The reason the difficulty is there, church, is because of the sin of Adam in the beginning. He took away the perfection that God desired us to live in. The key to that verse is verse 12. He says, Oh, our God, we have no might, neither know we what to do. Now, isn't that about the way we react to our crisis? What do I do here? It should never be, what should I do? It should be, oh, God, I'm depending on you. It's so hard to say when the enemy places something in our path that seems unsurmountable, that seems impossible, something that is plaguing us. It's hard to say, oh God, I rise up, I lift my eyes toward you, because the key to that verse is, he says, but our eyes are upon thee. Their eyes were not on them the multiplex of enemy that was coming after them. It's hard, church, to get your mind off of the impossible thing that's plaguing your life. Do I get an amen? Amen. amen. I hope I'm in the right place today. Yes. In this hour of evil and pollution and wickedness and murders and hurricanes and floods and the forest is burning, taking up our oxygen. Does that not say something to the church of Jesus Christ? I hear the words of the Apostle Paul when he said, besides those things that are without, I have these things that come on me daily. And where we get caught up is on the daily things. And we don't recognize what's going on out there that we should have intercession and prayer going at all times. 
and the kingdom of God is at hand. Jehoshaphat prayed and he says, Art thou not over all the kingdoms of the heathen? I don't know if you look at our nation today like it's heathen, but it is fastly, you know, cutting out God. But Jehoshaphat said, Aren't you the God that's over all that? He knew in his heart that he was. Do we know in our heart that he is? Do we believe that God's power, God's might, can not be conquered by the works of darkness? Church, our God is over all. And verse 14 of that chapter, I love this part. The Spirit of the Lord comes in the midst of the congregation. I want that to happen here. The Spirit of the Lord comes in the midst of the congregation. And the prophet rises up and he says in verse 15, Hearken ye, all you inhabitants, thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid, be not dismayed, by reason of this great difficulty or this great multitude. And I know you know the rest of this. For the battle is not yours, but it's God's. And all through Sunday school we were told to stand. You know, Paul says when you did everything you know to do, stand. Well, I like to just fall over and cry. <laughs> but we're supposed to stand. And this is what it says. It says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord with you. Fear not. Be nest, don't be dismayed, for the Lord will be with you. This is my notes. I had no understanding we would hear the message in Sunday school, but God is saying something to the church of Jesus Christ. Yes. We are going to have to learn to stand. Yes. We cannot be weakened by impossibilities, church. We cannot be weakened by small numbers. We cannot be weakened by finance. We cannot be weakened by those things that the enemy brings and forces upon us to cause warfare in our lives because God is greater. God is above all. You know, uh, <coughs> to everything there's a season, church. This is the word of God. There's, there's a time to live, a time to die. There, there, to everything there's a purpose. You know, a time for war and a time of peace. To everything, there is a purpose. And this is our purpose in this generation at this moment that we will make war against the powers of corruption that is coming not only to our own lives but to our nation. This is a season that God wants our church to rise up and stand firm. We don't have to do all the things that the world does to bring worship. We don't have to do all the things that the world does to draw a crowd. It's not about a crowd. It's about the power and the anointing of God. It's about Him coming. If He comes, that's all that's needed. Isaiah 14 is an awesome chapter. This passage of Scripture bears out that God, who is over all, has purpose for us to stand. This is a powerful prophetic word. Isaiah 14, 25. And it's written for our, our information because God is dealing with all humanity. He's dealing with Old Testament saints right through to the New Testament saints who is wrapped in the blood of Jesus. Verse 25, he says, I will break the Assyrian. You understand what the Assyrian is? Yeah. The Assyrian is the enemy. Mm -hmm. It's the enemy that was coming against Israel. He said, I will break the enemy in my land. How many know he's in our land? I will break the enemy in our land. I'll break him up on the mountains. I'll tread him under my foot. Then shall the yoke come off of us. And he said, my people and the burden shall depart from off their shoulders. I mean, church, there's so much power in God's dealing with the Israelites. Because we're not in the Old Testament, we're in the New Testament. But we're still dealing with warfare. We'll, we're still dealing with the enemy and the heathen nations. We're dealing with all the same things. Disobedience, sin. We're dealing with all those things. And the Lord says, you know, I'm in charge of the enemy. I will break him out of our land. That's why we need prayer and intercession and fasting. 
verse 26, if you don't remember anything else, remember this this morning. It's Isaiah 14, 26 and 27. This is the purpose. This is what God is saying to the church today. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out upon all nations. For the Lord of hosts hath pur purpose, and who shall disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? God is for us. No weapon that is formed against us is going to prosper. Well, you say, I died. And what is wrong with that? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> In this day, that is a timely message for us to see that God's hand is outstretched. He doesn't just care about us, this nation. He cares about all nations. Mm -hmm. He cares about those that have just suffered those horrific hurricanes. He cares about those people. He cares about all the nations. He will be God over all. Yes, he's God over our senators, he's God over our governors, he's God over the powers in our society, he's God over the president, he's God. Amen. He's God over our difficulties, he's God over our crisis, he's God over our finances, he's God over when we face the trial of our faith, he's still God. Where are we Christians today in the purpose of God? Where is Christianity at large in the purpose of God? You know, we matter to God. His light, his son's light is in us. And for his purpose, he has revealed the son of God that he might be manifested to work against the works of darkness. That's why Jesus that first he could cleanse us, and then that he could be so manifested that he could work against the power of darkness. First John 3, 7 says, little children, I love it when God gets personal with us. He says, little children, let, let no man deceive you. You know, because if you do right, you will be right. <coughs> You know, if you do truth, you'll be righteous. It says, he that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. Now, here's what I want you to see. For this purpose, the Son of God is manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil, because he is God over all. We are commissioned today, church, to be partakers of the afflictions of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's his purpose. That's his grace. 2 Timothy 1.8 says, Be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Do we even understand that? If you read Paul's letters, you will see the afflictions of the gospel that Paul suffered. There's a whole section and it tells everything he went through. And he ended up giving his life lived in prison in Scotland. Bonds and, and, and incarcerated in the house. So that's why he told Timothy, when he wrote this, he said to Timothy, he said, you have to be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel, but there's power of God in it. See, we want the power of God without the affliction. We want the power of God without the troubles and the difficulties. But that's what brings the power of God is when we have those things. Then we are empowered to deal with it. We're empowered to cope with it. And we're empowered to walk on, you know, in the adverse condition of our life. And we are strengthened by it. Paul said to Timothy, he said, he saved us, he called us with a holy calling according to his purpose and grace that he has given us in Jesus before the world began. But is now made manifest 
by the appearing of Jesus, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to the gospel. Mm -hmm. Powerful passage of scripture. But you know what, church? We have, we, you know, if you have two um, uh, magnets, you know, and they go together like this, you put them there and they go like that, or you turn them around and they go. And I think that's where Christianity is today. We're magnets, but here we are. Instead of being brought together. And what does this to us is afflictions, impossible situations, crisis, painful things. And, and we're still Christians, but instead of pulling close to God in the midst of our crisis and depending upon Him and trusting Him and loving him through the crisis because he has a purpose of grace for us. We see the purpose of God. He is over all. And we see it when we spoke to Paul. And I'm coming to a conclusion this morning. But the message that Jesus Christ himself gave to Paul is the same message that he gives to the church today. Because Paul wasn't one of those disciples that saw Jesus. We're one of those disciples. Most of us haven't saw Jesus. But Jesus revealed himself to Paul, and he will reveal himself to us. And when, when he revealed himself to Paul, it knocked Paul to the ground. Everybody knows this story of Paul. And then, what did he say to Paul? Rise and what? Stand. Rise and stand. Can you imagine how Paul was? He was struck down by light. He's laying on the ground. And some voice somewhere is talking. But somehow there's an innate response in him. He knows it's Lord. The, the, the darkest sinner out there knows there's a spirit of God. Because they can't be alive without the spirit of God, the breath of God. So somewhere they say, well, he died. It was a pretty awful cuss, but I know he's in heaven. See, because there's an instinct within them that there's a heaven. And they want to be for sure he's there. Or she's there. Do you understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> so, when this happened to Paul, that unction that was in him because he was birthed by God, he said, you know, he heard the voice, why persecute us thou at Lord? And the Lord says, rise and stand up. And I believe that that is what God is saying to the church today. Pastor. Yes, sir. I will work for you. I receive it. You are correct. We are under attack. That is the word. You, we are under attack. But Jesus taught us in great simplicity how to deal with it. When the disciples asked him how to pray, he said, Pray for the Father's will and her this is the heaven. The perfect will of God will answer our afflictions if we pray for it. Yes. And the end, the conclusion, is the glorious conclusion, is in the last verse of Revelation. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I receive that. I receive that straight from heaven. Sometimes we look at the Israelites and we think they're the chosen of God and they aren't. But we are adopted. You know, we're special because God has adopted us. And I, I believe what the Spirit of the Lord has just said to us. There must be a fresh concern in the body of Christ that he is coming. And the warfare is here. It's not just a nasty president. It's not those things. It's the dealings of God as he prepares us for that final moment. God does rule in heaven. 
God is superior. And he will conquer. Mm -hmm. Nothing can, this, this warfare that is coming, he, don't, he cannot come against God. God can't withstand it. But the saints have to be faithful. We have to be faithful in the midst of our affliction. So just let me say, when you feel this warfare, when you feel it, just remember that God is over all. God is in charge. Be not afraid. You know, don't, don't be dismayed by reason of any difficulty, any affliction, because the battle is not ours. It's the Lord's. And we must stand still and see the salvation of God. And that was so pungent in Sunday school today, you know, that we must stand against the works of darkness and be ready for what it is that's coming. You know, I would like to say that everything will be peace and quiet. No. But the Bible says when they say peace, peace, that's when the destruction will come. So let us be ready. Let us not go out of here feeling doomed. Let us go out of here saying, God, thank you that you will be over it all and you will come quickly to the end of all things. Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for your message to us. We thank you that you are Lord of all. We pray, Father God, that we'll be worthy for you to cover us, to hide us in your pavilion, and to keep us in the secret place of your presence. Finances of your people today, Father God, that as they get.